Good morning and welcome to this morning's service. I'm Ginny and I'll be leading us through today's service, the fourth Sunday after Trinity. We warmly welcome you, whether this is your first time, you're a regular visitor or if this is a chance passing. We hope you feel a real part of what is going on. Chris spoke to us last week about church not being a building but a community a family of believers. I think lockdown has helped to change the traditional idea people had of church. Just look at us now. I'm a teacher and school too is very different at the moment. We've been carrying out collective worship on the playground in our bubbles. And not only have we been worshipping within the school, we've found passers-by have been joining in They've been joining in as they walk past on the alleyway. So sharing worship with those who perhaps didn't intend going out to share in love of God. For now, although we're a part in body, we can be together in spirit. Let us begin our worship today in hope of the God who loves us and knows each one of us. We'll wait for God's Holy Spirit as we use the words on our screen. As we wait in silence, fill us with your spirit. As we listen to your word, fill us with your spirit. As we worship you in majesty, fill us with your spirit. As we long for your refreshing, Fill us with your spirit. As we long for your renewing, fill us with your spirit. As we long for your equipping, fill us with your spirit. As we long for your empowering, fill us with your spirit. Let's sing together. Good morning, church. Let's worship our God, our faithful God, unchanging. Call out 
to you again and again. I call out to you again and again. You are my rock in times of trouble. You lift me up when I fall down. All through the storm, your love is the anchor. My hope is in you alone. My rock in times of trouble, you lift me up when I fall down. All through the storm, your love is the. My hope is in you alone.
Now it's time for our confession. It's that time where we open our hearts and our minds to God to say sorry for the things we've done, for the things that we've thought, for the things that we've said, for the way that we've acted. If there's anything that you think you need to to say things you may regret we think of you now Father as we lift these things to you you raise the dead to life in the spirit Lord have mercy Lord have mercy you bring pardon and peace to the broken in heart. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You make one by your spirit the tall and divided. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May God forgive us by the death of his Son and strengthen us to live in the power of the Spirit all our days. Amen. Today's reading is Romans 7, 15 to 25. I do not understand what I do, for what I want to do, I do not do, but what I hate, I do. And if I do what I do not want to do, I agree that the law is good. As it is, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. For I know that good itself does not dwell in me, that it is my sinful nature, for I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. For I do not do the, the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is a sin living in me that does it. So I find this law at work, although I want to do good, evil is right there with me. For in my inner being, I delight in God's law. But I see another law at work in me, waging war against the law of my mind and making me a prisoner of the law of sin at work within me. What a wretched man I am, who will rescue me from this body that is subject to death? Thanks be to God who delivers me through Jesus Christ our Lord. This reading is Matthew 11 verse 16 to 19. To say what I can compare this generation, they are like children sitting in the marketplace and then calling out to others. We play at the pipe for you and you did not dance. We sang a dirge and you did not mourn. For John, we came neither eating or drinking, and they say, he has a demon. The son of man came eating and drinking, and they say, he is a glutton and a drunkard, a friend of tax collector and sinner, but wisdom is proved right by her deeds. This reading is Matthew eleven twenty-six 26 to the end. At that time, Jesus said, I praise you, Father. Lord of heaven and earth, because you have hidden these things from the wise and learned and revealed them to little children. Yes, Father, for this is what you were pleaded to do. All things have been committed to me by my Father. No one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, 
and those whom the Son chooses to reveal him. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's often true that if we want to change something, we need to begin by identifying and naming the problem. By recognising what's going on at the heart of the problem, by facing the issue and scoping the extent of it, and then by owning the responsibility for doing what we can to put it right. Now that's true in a wider sense, isn't it? Nationally and globally, a good recent example of it would be addressing the issue of systemic racial injustice. But it's also true in a micro sense, individually. We all perhaps can think about having one of those ah or even oof kind of moments where we realise that a problem resides in us personally, that the reason for our reaction or our behaviour might be down to jealousy or anxiety or the fact that we're afraid or maybe that something once happened to us that we never properly processed or came to terms with and from time to time it rises up in us in a destructive way. Quite often the path to healing and change begins with that moment of recognition, doesn't it? When our eyes are suddenly open to the truth, however uncomfortable that is. And the thing that's been inside us, the thing that's been hidden, is named. In Paul's letter to the Romans in chapter 7, essentially this is what he's doing. He's naming and identifying a root problem so that those who hear it can begin to respond in the light of that truth. The whole of chapter seven is really about the law of Moses. It follows Paul writing about the good kinds of behaviour that we should have as Christians. So I guess it would make sense then for him to go on and locate that within the parameters of the law. So perhaps to say that the law of Moses is a really good source of the rules or morals that all should live and work by. However, he does something different in this passage. What he's really saying when he's talking about the law is that actually it's a bit of a problem. Earlier in the chapter, Paul has explained what the law was for in the first place. That at one level, it's done its job. It's helped the Jewish family of God through the original covenant to define themselves, to understand their set-apartness for God and to live differently. However, since Jesus, things have changed. Belonging to the family of God is now defined in a different way. It's defined through Jesus Christ and by the Holy Spirit. So the Mosaic law has become a problem to some because the Mosaic law showed Israel that it was in a mess without salvation and sin is not to be messed about with because it's powerful. It showed them that evil is real and damages and destroys. Now the part of chapter 7 in Romans that we heard read today is actually really quite hard to read out, let alone to kind of make sense of Verse 19, for I do not do the good I want, but the evil I do not want is what I do. Now, if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I that do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For some reason, it reminds me a bit of Shakespeare's wordplay. You could take it at surface level and see that Paul is perhaps talking about a wrestling going on within himself, and perhaps in part he is. But some commentators suggest that that's not really what he's doing here. What he's talking about is, in fact, what happens when the law meets sinful humanity, when those two things rub up against one another. Now, the law is a spiritual thing. It calls the people into covenant relationship with God. Israel, however, were descendants of Adam who stepped out of that covenant relationship with God through sin. And Israel finds that the family habit dies hard. They're unable themselves to break that cycle of sin. It's as if they're enslaved to it. 
the law showed Israel that it wasn't sufficient for them to claim to be favoured in God's sight just because they had the law. They found themselves through it to be just like the rest of the world when it came to sin, guilty as charged. Now, Paul is doing a really clever thing with the way that he describes this in the letter to the Roman Christians. This way of talking or writing, this I want to do this, but I find myself doing that, is that in the same tradition of uh, Greek and Roman philosophy and poetry, where quite commonly the writer would state that they knew what the right course of action was, but somehow they found themselves doing wrong. Or they knew that a particular thing was wrong, but they find themselves doing it despite. So Paul is using that same technique when he talks about the problem Israel has under the law of Moses. And he's saying to his audience, to the Roman Christians, look, we're all the same. Jew, Greek, Roman, however good the law is and however hard we try, none of us are able to overcome this problem of sin. So why does Paul go to such great lengths to make this argument so watertight, so applicable to all? Well, he hints at it in verse 25 and then he develops it later, most powerfully actually in Romans chapter 8. But I'm not going to go into that now because it's going to come up in our readings next week. What Paul says is, this may be the case, but there is a rescuer. There is one who can overcome this problem of sin once and for all. Who will rescue me from this body of death, says Paul? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ, our Lord. So Paul is naming the reality of sin and its impact and the impossibility of overcoming it ourselves. He's clearing the way, much like John the Baptist did, so that hearts and minds can be open to Christ. Now, in the passage of Matthew, from Matthew, we read about the reaction of Israel, the people of God, to this rescue plan, and especially about the failure of the scribes and the Pharisees, those who were meant to be leading the people of God into life, to recognise what happened in Christ, to uh, recognise the activity of God in this rescue plan and to be able to repent and to change and to lead the people in the right direction. So to Jesus, it's like children who get upset when they can't get their playmates to join in with their game in exactly the way they want them to. So John the Baptist isn't accepted because he's a hermit and a loner with a weird diet and Jesus isn't accepted. He doesn't have a weird diet and he does eat and drink normally and he hangs out with people, but all the wrong people. The end of that passage is praise from Jesus to the Father. Jesus sees the huge gap in understanding of who the Father is because nobody knows God like Jesus knows God. And the scribes and the Pharisees represent a long tradition of trying to get to that understanding, but through wisdom and through study and through the application of law and knowledge. And it falls short. It's a bit like Paul's argument about getting over the problem of sin through sticking to the law. It's an impossible task. It's the wrong route. Lay down the burden of the law and the commandments to try and understand and to curry favour with God. Instead, Come to Jesus like a child and take instead his root of mercy and of love, the gift of his salvation. Come and see the living God revealed in the Son. Learn by accepting that loving invitation to journey with him, watching what he does, hearing what he says. Stop, it says this, this piece, stop dragging behind you the heavy impossibility of saving yourself, of working your own way out of whatever challenges you're facing in life. In fact, stop trying to do life at all without the sustaining love and advocacy of Jesus Christ, without the Holy Spirit as enabler and guide. In other words, stop going against the grain and working so hard. Come to the Son if you want to see the Father. Come to me, all you who are weary and are carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Why go anywhere else? 
No. Now, it's true that to come to Jesus means that we must submit our lives to his authority. That's the yoke. It's an old fashioned word now, especially in this part of the world. But it was a piece of wood that was shaped to fit over the necks of two animals who could work side by side. So perhaps oxen pulling a cart or a plough so that they could share that load. And in the Bible, the word yoke is also used to represent the weight or burden of a particular task or duty. Jesus' yoke is an easy yoke and not an oppressive one because he carries the burden with us. But it does mean trusting his methods and going his way. In the pressure cooker of these times, there's been a bit of room for introspection, hasn't there? And a lot of scope, I think, for people to bring out the best and the worst in one another. So it's quite likely that some of the murkier and less appealing things in ourselves that we've been perhaps able to suppress more easily when we've been living out our usual busy lives and um, being able to distract ourselves. Some of these things have probably been able to float to the surface more and uh, make an unwelcome appearance perhaps again. So my question for today is, what burden am I carrying today that is destructive to myself or to others or is holding me back in some way? Am I maybe hurting those around me because of something I need to acknowledge that's hurt me? Is there something negative from my past experience or perhaps an area of unforgiveness that's eating away? I wonder if it might be time to recognise and name that thing, to accept that it's not something that we can shift by ourselves, but instead to know that we can bring it to Jesus for his transformation so we can release it, begin that process of healing, that process of change and start to go his way instead. Because when we bring things into the light, it does actually deplete the power of evil and sin, and make space for the activity of God in that place of deepest need. Naming stuff that's hidden is powerful. In the process of doing that, it will mean that sometimes God will need to lead us to others who can help, professionals or other trusted Christian friends perhaps. So we need to listen to the prompting of the Spirit and be wise about that. It's not always a solo project. But here, in these passages today, we have a clear urging from Paul and an open invitation from Jesus, both of which are designed to point us away from pain and sin and towards freedom and life. God's purposes towards us are good and born of the greatest love. John chapter 8, 36. If the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Amen. Let us declare our faith in God. Do you believe and trust in God the Father, source of all being and life, the one for whom we exist? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God the Son, who took our human nature, died for us and rose again? I believe and trust in him. Do you believe and trust in God, the Holy Spirit, who gives life to the people of God and makes Christ known in the world? I believe and trust in him. This is the faith of the church. This is our faith. We believe and trust in one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Let us pray to our Heavenly Father. 
Lord of all, wherever Christians are ridiculed or persecuted for their faith, we ask your courage and inner strength. Wherever we are called to be your witnesses, we ask for the grace to communicate your love. Wherever love for you has grown cold, we ask to fan the flames again. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. Lord, wherever the human spirit is ground down by oppression, and wherever our silence allows injustice and corruption to flourish, we ask for deeper compassion and commitment. We ask for our kingdoms to become your kingdoms, and the desires of your heart to be ours. Lord, in your mercy, hear, hear our prayer. prayer. We pray for our local communities. Lord of all, wherever families are struggling to stay together, and wherever there are ongoing arguments and family feuds, we ask your anointing for tranquility and harmony. Wherever children are unwanted and unloved, neglected or in danger, we ask your protection and help. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And a prayer from Tear Fund for these times. Father God, thank you for the gift of relationship and community. We pray this crisis will bring people together, not draw them apart. For those of us who are anxious, bring peace. For those of us who are sick, bring healing. For those of us caring for others, bring strength. For those of us who are lonely, bring comfort. For those of us who are not lonely, help us to see those who are and help us reach out to them in whatever ways we can. We pray that this crisis will bring about renewed trust in your goodness. Merciful Father, accept, accept these prayers for the, for the sake, sake of your Son, our Saviour, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. And forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Good morning everyone and welcome to church. Hope you're all well and enjoying the service. Um, I thought last week's service was really good, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, the only notice I have for you this week is from Anne Price and you may remember last year she was doing the Ride and Stride uh, organising and it's happening again this year on Saturday the 12th of September so notices will be going out in the electronic versions of notices but um, please support that if you can and if you want any more information uh, contact Anne Price and I'm sure uh, she'll be happy to talk to you about it. Um, lots of stuff going on in the background with um, the virus restrictions uh, changing what seems to be daily so um, we'll keep you informed as best we can on any developments on that side and hopefully uh, we'll be able to see each other in the not too distant future. So have a lovely week and I look forward to seeing you soon. Bye. During the lockdown we've been asking people to share with us where they have seen God at work in their lives. Today Paul Newman is going to talk to us about something very close to his heart. Good morning church. I've been asked to say a few words about how my life has changed during lockdown and how God has spoken to me. Well, my hair bears witness to my wife's lack of uh, skills with the clippers. Not had hair this long since the 1970s. But other than that, 
the, the odd evening trips to the supermarket, life has stayed pretty much the same. I work at a garage near the QEQM, so we've been able to stay open and keep vehicles for many staff of the NHS on the road. So it's a, a vital service. Work takes a bit longer as I have to use hand gel and we have to always each job clean the cars and sterilise the steering wheels, the, the gear knobs, the door lock handles before handing them back to customers. But I praise God that we've I've able to continue to be busy. And there was only one week which I've been we might have been furloughed where work slowed down. But during the lockdown, what I've really, really missed is being at church and being part of the community of Seasalter and worshipping there. But God has kept me safe so far and and we've kept focused on what's happening around us and with my job. I've been out and about each day and I know God is with me and I'm more grateful for that from what words can say. Miss you all church and look forward to seeing you. Take care. Bye. What a beautiful name.
you for your name that is full of might and power. We serve a mighty God. Thank you. Amen. Be that my vision. sharing our closing sentences together. At the beginning of lockdown, several churches got together and sung The Blessing over the UK. This was uploaded on YouTube and has received over 3 million views. After today's service, we're going to share The Blessing, um, but this time it's going to be signed in Makaton. This is then going to be followed by our Sunday school led by Andrew and Lise. Now let's share our closing sentences together. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. Blessing, honour and glory be yours, here and everywhere, now and forever. Amen. Be careful, be prayerful and keep God always in your hearts. See you soon.
keep you Make his face shine upon you And be gracious to you Lord, turn his face toward you And keep you peace The Lord bless you And keep you Make his face shine upon you And be gracious to you The Lord turn his face toward you from heaven this isn't second guessing we know that we are protected may the peace that surpasses all understanding be our message grace and favors in your nature in your essence may favor be upon you and a thousand generations and your family and your children and the children and the children may his favor be upon you and a thousand
Hi and welcome. Today it's Sunday the 2nd of July and it is very lovely to have you with me. My name is Lise Jennings and I am one of the children's ministers at St Alfred's Sea Salter Christian Centre in Kent. So you are very welcome. Let me tell you what we need today. As always, we need a Bible. You need some A4 card and some pens and some scissors. And there is a template on Facebook if you need one, but you probably won't need one, but it's there just in case. So welcome. I'm gonna pray, as I always do, for your relationship to be deepened with God. And the reason I do that is because that God put that on my heart for each one of you, so that when you need to stand firm, you will be able to, because your roots are deep in Christ. So let's pray. Father God, thank you um, for the fact that we can be with you and listen to your word. I pray that you will deepen our relationship with you as we spend time reading your word. Bless each one who does that, Lord, I pray. Amen. So welcome. Now today I'm going to Mommy, talk to you. table tennis ball went over the fence. Go and knock on next door and see if they can get it back. Okay. So, oh, as I say, run out of loo roll. Oh, there's a toilet roll up there. Thank you. Right, so as I say, this morning we are going to be talking about peace. Excuse me a minute. Hello? Yes, hi Pam, yeah, I'm just recording for Sunday school, is that okay? Yeah, I'll ring you back later. All right, bye. Let me try that again. I am going to talk to you about the word peace. So let's find out in our Bible. Open your Bibles to the New Testament. We are going to be looking at Luke chapter 10 verses 1 to 9. So that's Matthew, Mark, Luke in the New Testament, chapter 10 verses 1 to 9. So let's read together. After this, the Lord chose 72 others. He sent them out in pairs. He sent them ahead of him into every town and place where he planned to go. He said to them, there are a great many people to harvest, but there are only a few workers to harvest them. God owns the harvest. Pray to God that he will send more workers to help gather his harvest. You can go now, but listen, I am sending you and you will be like sheep among wolves. Don't carry a purse, a bag or sandals. Don't stop to talk with anyone on the road. Before you go into a house, say, peace be with this house. If a peaceful man lives there, your blessing of peace will stay with him. If the man is not peaceful, then your blessings of peace will come back to you. Stay in the peaceful house, eat and drink what the people there give you. A worker should be given his pay. Don't move from house to house. If you go into a town and the people welcome you, eat what they give you. Heal the sick who live there. Tell them the kingdom of God is soon coming to you. That's really interesting, isn't it? Peace. Now, it's not the sort of peace that I was trying to get earlier. It's not that so much things happening. It's a different kind of peace. Imagine um, a jigsaw and you've got 99 pieces, not 100. You can't find that piece. And then you find that one piece of puzzle and it makes it complete. It makes it whole. And that's the kind of piece I'm talking about. It's different to peace and quiet, that wholeness that God gives us. And God wants us to have that peace. Now, when we sin, when we do things wrong, that is when we don't feel that peace. But Jesus died on the cross for us, for each one of us, so that we have that peace. And we can have that peace when we pray. When someone's ill or if we're worried or something's happening, we can pray and ask God for that peace. It doesn't mean everything's going to be OK, but it means that when things are tough, you can still feel God's peace inside you. But there's also something else, and that is God chose 72, the 72. But God has also chosen you. Yes, you. 
And that is really important because later we are asked to go and tell the world. And God has chosen you to do that. Not just me, not just Paulette, not just other people, but you. And that's really important for you to know. So let's find out what we're going to do for our craft. It talked about the Bible verse that we looked about, the chapter, talked about peace and putting peace on the house that they came to rest at and to stay at. So we are going to be making a door sign for our bedroom doors. So can you see here, I have cut out a template and then I have coloured it. Now one side, you can see it says peace, <coughs> but the other side, it says, God chose me. Now the idea is that this is going to go on our doors and it's going to remind us to pray for peace. Now, I don't know about you, but I think I told you last week that one place I feel really peaceful is in my bedroom. And I sit there and I close the door and I will take time to pray. And that is going to be your challenge. I want you to think about your bedroom or somewhere that you might feel peaceful. It might be outside. It might be a grandparent's house. It could be anywhere. But your challenge is to use Lego. Now, I know almost all of us will have Lego at home. To use Lego to build your place of peace. And if there isn't somewhere that you feel peaceful, maybe you could build something that you think would make you feel peaceful. And then pray, Father God, please give me your peace. But there's also something else I want us to do, and that is to pray for God's peace right now. So, Father God, I pray your peace, your perfect peace into our lives. Help us to, to come to you and pray for peace. I ask this in your name. Amen. So, I want you to think, every time you go into your bedroom... You can remember to pray for peace. And you can also remember that God chose you. Well, God bless and lots of love. I'm going to say goodbye now. But remember, God isn't going to say goodbye because he is always with you all the time. Lots of love. Goodbye. <laughs>